All right, hi everyone. Who's ready for some comfort and wisdom around death? You? Yeah, me too. I am also ready for that. It's happened, there is a gosh darn pandemic on. Many of you had questions for me, such as, where are you? What's going to happen to your funeral home? What's going to happen to your videos? And so I'm setting up my phone on this milk crate to talk to you. This is not gonna be a fancy video, FYI. No Photoshop delights in this one. You get me and a brick wall. First question, where am I? Where am I? <laughs> Do you mean emotionally or literally? Literally, I am in Texas. Here's the deal. I am right smack in the middle of a two month road trip. All of January, all of February, I was working full time at the funeral home and making videos because the plan was I was going to take two months off to focus entirely on writing this next book. That includes researching. I was gonna give a couple talks too, but mostly I was gonna be focusing on writing this new book. You would be surprised, or you probably would not be surprised, how many news outlets, TV outlets have been contacting me wanting a frontline narrative, mortician on the edge, bodies piling up everywhere. And one, I've had to say, listen, I'm in Texas, sorry. And two, that is just not the reality of coronavirus and COVID yet in Los Angeles. Los Angeles County, which has over 10 million people, has only had seven deaths so far, seven. To be clear, that number is going to rise. Of course it is. But I don't think it's particularly helpful to have a media narrative that's acting as if funeral homes are currently in pandemic conditions, that there are bodies piling up everywhere, that we're just cremating people in a pile or digging a trench somewhere. That is not what is happening. There are really bad reports coming out of Northern Italy and I have family in Northern Italy, so that is scary and it freaks me out. But again, not helpful to try to indicate that that is what is happening in the United States right now, because at the moment it is not. And I don't think it ever will be because I think we have a more robust death infrastructure set up and in place. So the question is, do I go back to Los Angeles right now? I could do that as an essential worker. I could say, everybody out of the way, I gotta go back. I have my car, so by road tripping all the way back to LA, I'm potentially acting as a vector and endangering people as I go when I'm supposed to be sheltering in place. We have not had a coronavirus case yet at our funeral home, because again, only seven people officially have died from it. So will there be a time where I have to go back? Maybe, but that time is not this moment. My employees and colleagues are there. They have all of the COVID corona precautions in place at the funeral home. I'll talk more about those in a bit. Number one question for me is, are coronavirus bodies dangerous? And here's the thing, we don't really know. We do not think that they are. At this moment, the CDC, the scientists, do not believe that coronavirus bodies are infectious or are infecting other people. But we cannot guarantee that, which is why all of these precautions are being taken. My personal advocacy is to tell you that it's completely safe to be around a dead body and it's incredibly moving to be with a dead body. So if anyone was going to lie to you and tell you it was completely safe. It would be me, frankly, but uh, I need to be a responsible Rhonda here and say that we don't know. It's not completely clear yet because this took everyone by surprise and there were not real solid procedures in place. It's believed they're probably not dangerous because it's a coughing and expectorating disease and it's shared through those droplets on surfaces and through the air. And a dead person is not doing that coughing. Even if it's not directly coming from the dead body, there are so many other factors surrounding the body that make it potentially dangerous for funeral workers. First of all, all the family and medical professionals surrounding the dead person who may also have been infected. Second, all the surfaces all around the medical facility that potentially could be contaminated. Funeral directors and removal people really should be careful right now until we know more. Autopsy technicians and embalmers need to be even more 
careful because they're puncturing the body, they're puncturing the lungs, they're puncturing kind of the center of the disease. That puts them at the highest risk. However, if they use all of the personal protective equipment, if they follow what the CDC guidelines are, standard precautionary equipment, they're being safe, they're disinfecting, there's no evidence yet that it should be a problem. To be clear, no dead body is ever more dangerous than a living body. And it comes back to the same thing we've been saying for weeks about coronavirus, is that it's the living that are dangerous. And that's hard, right? I was talking about this on Instagram the other day. The idea that we want to help. It is so in our human nature to be heroic right now, to go out there and help and do what we can. And we're being told all you can do to help is to get out of the way, to stay inside. You are the disease vector. You are the problem. And that's, I think, really painful for us and hard to swallow because this is a time where we want humanity and connection most and we are being denied it. Next question, what are my rights if I still want a funeral? What happens if somebody dies of coronavirus or of just pancreatic cancer or something completely unrelated? What are my rights to a funeral right now? This is also a moving target and changing all the time. So if you're watching this three, four months from now, sorry, this is what it was at the end of March, 2020. Just as any other large event is canceled. Going to Disneyland, concerts, weddings, funerals are canceled not because the dead body is radioactively shooting out coronavirus particles, but because all of the living people should not be in a large group together. This is actually a kind of fascinating existential question because when you talk about essential workers, we're telling people who work at Target or the supermarket, you have to be around a bunch of people because it's essential that people be able to eat. Funeral workers, even though they have to go pick up the bodies and cremate the bodies, most funeral homes are not allowing services at all because a funeral is not essential. But that's really hard to tell people whose mom just died and the body just disappears into the ether and is cremated and they never get to see her. You know, is eating more essential than a funeral? Yes, of course, on the surface it is, but having now to define what we value as essential in a culture, I think is an existential question that we're going to be grappling with for quite a while. As of this moment, most funeral homes have either canceled group services entirely, or they have said no more than 10 people may come to the funeral home. Funeral homes in the United States are private businesses, so you cannot go to a funeral home and demand to see mom. You can take mom away, you can pick her up and put her in the back of a pickup and take her away, but you can't demand that they open their funeral home for you, put themselves at risk for a large group of your family to come in and see mom. You just cannot force a private business to do that at this moment. Which leads to another one of your questions, which is what is your experience with live streaming funerals? The answer is no experience. I have no experience live streaming funerals because the point of my honestly quite boutique funeral home, is to come in, wash the body, dress the body, have that personalized touching experience with the body. So live streaming funerals, it's not that I'm not very happy that it is available right now. And we're actually at my funeral home looking into ways to potentially offer it if this continues for a long period of time, but it's not the norm for us. And I hope that it doesn't become the norm in general, which leads to yet another common question that I've been getting, which is, do you worry that this is going to affect how people see death and the dead body long-term? Absolutely, I do. It worries me to think of how living people are going to interact with each other going forward, as well as how we're going to treat dead people, because I think we're always looking for a way to marginalize dead people. I think we're always looking for a way to convince ourselves that the dead are dangerous, that they're bad, that they're scary. 
And something like this, of course, certainly does not help. I think about the Spanish flu in 1918, which caused mass death. And that was one of the reasons that the funeral industry was really able to come in and say, you're exhausted. You don't want to care for your dead. Let us do it. Bring us your dead. In the wake of this pandemic, what technology is going to rise up to bring us perhaps once again further away from death and a sense of our own mortality? And live streaming is potentially one of those things. Some technology I'm wary of, but at the same time, the technology that we use at my funeral home that allows us to do most of our arrangements online, if necessary, has allowed my funeral director to work from home during the pandemic, which is a thing that not all funeral homes can offer. I was at a cemetery in Terlingua, Texas, which by the way, cemeteries, great for social distancing, just a pitch. Many of the people in this cemetery had died in that pandemic in 1918. And here we were basically a hundred years later, experiencing some of those fears and experiencing some of the same things. I also did a video last fall with the Mütter Museum. They had a whole exhibit about it. And we talked about the handling of the bodies after that 1918 pandemic. And we certainly didn't know about coronavirus at the time, but I think it's interesting to watch and look back on. So I'll link that below as well. Last question I've been getting a lot is what happens if this gets really bad? in the US or the UK. My answer for that is that even if there are many deaths, and we know there's going to be many deaths, that cat has already gotten out of the barn, or whatever it is, out of the bag, out of the death bag, who knows, viral bag, this is going really well. I believe that we have the infrastructure to handle it. We could treat the pandemic like we treat a mass disaster situation where bodies would have to be put into refrigerated storage, photographed, carefully labeled, cataloged, and maybe the cremation or the burial could not take place right away. Now, is that ideal? No, of course not. And if you have a religion where the body or the burial has to be taken care of right away, maybe you would get a special dispensation to say, this is done right now for you. But it also might be two months till the cremation could take place. And that is terrible, but those bodies would be safe. They would be under cold storage. I just don't ever see there being a time where we're talking about mass burial pits at the edge of town somewhere. I just don't think that's going to happen here. I think we have the infrastructure. I think we have the resources. I think we have the organization to not have that happen, which is good news. Sort of. You would think social distancing would be an excellent time to work on your book on death, but that has not proven to be the case. I think everyone's been doing a very good job of acknowledging how lucky they are in whatever scenario they're in right now, which is an important, if everybody was falling apart and being like, oh, I couldn't get my latte, then society would just fall apart. So I will do my part and say, actually, I am incredibly lucky. I will also say that I have so much respect right now for my colleagues in Seattle and New York, who I've been speaking to, who are picking up these coronavirus cases and working with them and protecting themselves, but also protecting themselves from the burnout and fear that surrounds this kind of situation. Because even if the death rate is not actually higher, the stress rate is of course higher because we don't totally know what's going on yet. And they're just protecting themselves and having to talk to the families and do the best job that they can. So I salute them. I salute all essential workers, everyone out there who is doing the very best they can to make sure that people are safe. And I also salute you if you were staying indoors, except for your daily constitutional through the cemetery. Oh, videos. That's right. We spent the first couple months of this year traveling around, recording, creating videos so I could be gone for these two months and not be filming. We have these videos in the bag. We're editing them right now. They're all ambitious and good, and we're gonna continue to roll them out because you all need something to do in your home. So why not take a break from your profound fear of death to watch some videos about death? This video was made with generous donations from death enthusiasts just like you. Last question, will you adopt me?
Not right now. You're supposed to be socially isolating. Now is not the time to create a new family. Stay where you are. I'll adopt you later. The reason it's so stressful to watch CNN is because they do not deliver the